Hello everyone, I'm Robert Icy. Most of you will know me, but for you that don't, I'm the UK's number one unconscious mind therapist. And welcome to the Mind Clap Podcast. Hello everyone, I'm Robert Icy, the UK's number one unconscious mind therapist. And I've got a very special guest today on the podcast, on the Mind Clap Podcast. We have the, if everyone's seen the, the documentary of, Ty, um, of Tiger King on Netflix, which I'm, you know most people have by now. And we've got the world famous, the lovely Carol Baskin, who's now has songs written about her and everything. So everything's changed. Right? <laughs> and she write, rolls her eyes there. She rolls her eyes. <laughs> so I was, uh, you know, I've, I watched the, um, the documentary and everything. And I, you know, I deal with like mental health. That's what I work, the industry I work in. And, you know, after watching that documentary, it must have took a, a bloody toll on your mental health to have that out there and, you know, put your, everything in public and also have someone put a hit on you. I mean, it's just, it's like saying from a storybook, you know, it's like, it's mad. How did, how, how did that, um, how, how was that for you, Carol? Well, it was a shock. Um, <clears throat> we had worked with the Tiger King producers for five years on what they said was going to be a program called Stolen Wildlife and that it was going to be exposing all of the abuse that these poor cubs go through and then how they end up being discarded in pet homes and how that's causing the extinction of the tiger in the wild by creating this legal smoke screen for illegal activities. So for five years, we're giving them all this information, we're hooking them up with all of the experts in the field. And then when the show started teasing on Netflix, we called them up and we were like, who's doing that show? That, that doesn't look like anything that you and I were talking about. And all of a sudden they didn't want to talk about it. And so we sat there and binge watched it just like everybody else did because we oh. did not believe what we were seeing <laughs> as oh the God. entire world apparently had the same reaction. And is that, is that, was that legal in America to just be able to do that? Apparently. Apparently it looks um, like. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that much choice in the matter. <laughs> There's supposed to be a difference between documentaries and like reality shows or scripted yeah. TV. And yet they called this a documentary, but there wasn't a whole lot of truth in it. And so many of the things that they uh, posted out there to the public as being fact, and then they had all of these animal abusers line up and say, oh yeah, this is a fact, this is a fact, this is a fact. And it's like, these guys are a bunch of animal abusers and criminals. Why are you taking their word for it when you can go down to the public record, pull the files and see that that's not true? So it wasn't much in the way of journalism. So, you know, as far as how I felt about that personally, I feel like everybody is doing the best that they know how to do at this point in their lives. And I think that they probably did start out with a different um, plan as far as what their show was gonna be. But I know they tried to sell it in 2018 to CNN, and CNN turned it down. And so I think they're looking at, you know, we've spent at this time four or five years working on this film. We've got all this money invested. How are we ever going to recoup from it? And decided to just turn it into the freak show that everybody got to see that turned out being a big hit. And <clears throat> I was told they made $16 million off of it. So wow. apparently they had 16 million reasons to <laughs> turn it into the freak yeah, show. Yeah. To get it. But it seemed to work, didn't it? I mean, everyone was talking about it. Oh, Rich, come out of nowhere. And then that week, I mean, it was like, it was like a week. It was, it was like some sort of week. And everyone was just going, you watch a Tiger King, you watch a Tiger King. And, um, but yeah, but I mean, what, what, what you was what you was going through there, um, you know, at the end of it and everything, after putting a, a hit on your life. I mean, how did that, did you expect that from the Giza? Or was it complete shock when they told you he had a, you know, such a hit on your head? Well, my reaction to the, the television show was a feeling of betrayal. As far as the hit goes, the show only talked about the one hit that Joe had planned with the derelict lawn care guy that he had, um, <laughs> Al Glover, and then that he had gone and tried to hire the undercover FBI agent as well. So they didn't talk about all of the people who have threatened my life over the years, going back decades. They didn't talk about the fact that as far back as 2011, Joe was talking about hiring a hitman to kill me. And in 2015, two wow. came to me and said that Joe had tried to pay. One of them said they, he tried to pay her husband to kill me. Another one said he tried to pay her directly to kill me. So these 
reports had been coming in for years and I had been turning them over to the FBI and to the local authorities and they just hadn't done anything about it. So in addition to his threats, there were a number of other people in the show who have threatened me. And I've been physically attacked by these animal abusers when I go to speak at public events about protecting the cats, where you know I've had my hair church out and I had one guy run up behind me and try to knock me down from behind and he knocked over one of my volunteers. And so some circus guy came and intervened for us. And that's just been the nature of my life, trying to protect these cats from some really cruel, vicious people. So you could, so how did that affect you? Like when you go for anxiety, did you ever get worried? Was you hiding behind closed doors any times or was you able to sort of just move on? How did, how did you cope with that? I'm not an anxious person because I really believe everything is happening exactly as it needs to in order for us to reach a higher level of elevation and enlightenment. And I believe that we're eternal and that we kind of sign up on the other side of the veil that's like, all right, we're going to attack this one more time. <laughs> we're all going to play our roles and we're going to come in here and we're going to do our part to try and do something better with all of humanity. And having that kind of an attitude, I think, has made it easier for me to deal with the betrayals and the threats and all of that, because I feel like things will turn out exactly as they're supposed to. And all I have to do is figure out what the good in whatever it was, was so that I can take that away and move forward with it. Brilliant, brilliant. And, and you know, like with the um, keeping the vision going of keeping your place you know, moving forward. How, how did you work that inside your mind? I mean, what do you do? Is it like a daily basis? Do you practice like visualizing how it's going to be? A, you know, what, are you going to set up the next year's project? How do you work with your creative mind? How do you, is there a sort of process that Carol does to keep this going, to keep the keep the bad people away, keep the tigers happy and, and keep building the, the brand as such? On my honeymoon to my husband, Howard Baskin, I actually sat down and wrote out a 25 year plan and I've done a number of 10 year plans since then and five year plans and three year plans. But every single morning when I wake up, I lay there in bed and I just lay there thanking the universe for every opportunity. Here I am. I'm awake again today. I get the opportunity to go out there and do what I came here to do and feeling that level of gratitude and appreciation for everything that has brought me to where I am. I think helps me to then take on the day, no matter what it turns out to be, and make the most of that. So it, it's a lot of planning to be happy. Yeah, I can. I, I got. Um, I have got sort of a a nice. What's the word? A vibration off you. Like you're very calm and different. I didn't know what I expected, but you seem very calm and in tune. So that's lovely. So you practice every day, you practice your, gra you practice your gratitude. And um, so with, with all them goals you wrote 25 years ago, how far have you come with them? Have they actually got where you want? Really, really far. In fact, I was looking at um, something just recently. Oh, a vision board that I had done in like 2006, 2004. And I was like, oh my gosh, all of the things that are on this vision board, and it's not an actual board, it's a slideshow that I play in the morning. Yeah. But um, so many of those things have already occurred. And so many of them were so close to, and the same thing goes with the 25 year plan. My 25 year plan was to put ourselves out of business. There shouldn't have to be a need for a sanctuary that rescues big cats from horrific situations. We just need to stop those horrific situations. And we're so close to doing that now. So yeah, it's amazing. Really That's amazing. You, you actually don't want the parks and you want them to, you want them closed. I, yeah, there shouldn't be any big cats in cages. They, they just do not belong in cages. And our practice of keeping cats in cages and calling that conservation and calling that education, I think that's the worst thing you can teach a child that it's okay to take away the the rights and the privileges the birthrights of some other on this planet so that you can be amused by them what kind of what kind of message have we been teaching our people yeah so tell me about the the the, the young you when you was a kid I, I mean how'd you get into these big these big cats in the first place i mean how, how, what was you know the young nine ten year old you know, teenager Carol Baskin, what was, 
What was life like for you? Was you brought up in a, what sort of background you come from? What was it like as a child? It started really young that I loved cats. And in fact, People Magazine had asked me for some pictures of me when I was a kid. And so I was going through some of my mother's old uh, photo albums. And you know how the old type photo albums are like on sticky paper and under a plastic layer. I don't know if you're yes, old. Yes, yeah, I've got some. I still got them from when I was a kid. Yeah, I've still got them. Yeah. You put it back. So I was and down. Yeah. I was peeing <laughs> because I needed to scan them to be able to send them to people. And I pulled off the very first photo that my parents have of me when they just brought me home from the hospital. My mother's holding me up and my father's holding up this little tabby cat. And on the back of the picture, it says that the cat's name was Tiger. And I thought, well, wasn't that, <laughs> wasn't that something? But I didn't have a fascination for big cats or tigers or anything as I was a kid. I loved cats, domestic cats. And when I was eight, my grandmother took my cat to, my, my cat had kittens, and she took her to an animal shelter. And she told me that she was going to get this great home, and her kittens were going to get this great home. And I learned not too long after that, that millions of cats and kittens are dying in our shelters every year due to overpopulation. And so I just set out then to make it my life's mission that I was going to fix that. And so I was the kid in the neighborhood. We lived in trailer parks and um, we're pretty poor, but I would round up all the kids in the neighborhood and we would wash the cars, we'd wash the trailers, we'd cut the yards and trim the flowers and anything to earn a buck. We sold popcorn and lemonade. I nearly burned our trailer down trying to make popcorn. I've never been able to cook. <laughs> <laughs> so it was that old Jiffy Pop style where you know, you've got like fire and everything going on. It's not like a microwave anymore. But um, I always felt like I needed to build up this huge wealth of cash because this was going to be, if there were millions of cats and kittens being killed, this was going to be millions of dollars I had to build up to, to fix this problem. And so I always worked, I left home at the age of 15 and I always worked two and three jobs at a time. I've always worked seven days a week and I worked from about 7.30 in the morning to about seven o'clock at night and have just always done that. I, I might take off, I think, Yesterday, well, three days ago, I took off for the third time this year. I took a day off and I managed to keep myself un, unwork related for about three hours. <laughs> but it's just that driving mission to fix that problem. And so how, old you, how old did you then when you wanted to start with like the little cats? You wanted to, how, you know, deal with that. How old was you there roughly when you first got that vision of right? This needs to change. Eight. 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 Wow. And then you become obsessed with that ever since, that vision. Yeah, I even sold Amway door to door. Uh, <laughs> I would do anything <laughs> to raise money for the cats. And so, you know, of course, all of the cats who ended up being injured, hit by cars, shot by neighbors and such would always manage to find their way to my door. And so I would take them to the vets and get them fixed up. And because I spent so much time in vet offices, what I discovered by the time I was 17 is that if a bobcat where are you from? Do you have local bobcats where you live? Bobcats, like wild cats. Yeah, are you in the UK? Yeah, I'm in London, near London, just outside London. I'm in Essex now, but I'm from South London originally. But yeah, we have bobcats. <laughs> um, here in the US, we do. What's a bobcat? It's like, um, I have one on my desk. It's about a 25 pound cat here in Florida. Oh, wow. <laughs> Um, they can get to be about 40 pounds up north. They're just <laughs> but, wild. Pardon? They're just running around wild. Yes. Wow. And they do really well in the Americas. Most people have bobcats living in their neighborhoods and they don't even know it. And they're attracted to the rats and mice that people bring into <laughs> everywhere people go. You've got trash and rats and bobcats are great vermin killers. But they get hit by cars and shot by hunters. And so the vets can fix them up in like 30 minutes to an hour, but then you're talking months of rehab for that animal to heal before it can go back to the wild. So they would always say, you like cats, take it home and see if you can get this cat back to the wild. So I started doing that when I was 17. And by the time I had built up my real estate business to the point where it was pretty much on autopilot, I was 31 or 32. And I was at an auction with my late husband, Don, we were buying llamas because you could turn llamas loose on big tracts of land. And you could pretty much draw a line in the sand and tell the llama don't go over that line. And they're like fine with that. Whereas goats or cows or anything else, they're wandering off. 
but we would turn them loose on these big properties and they clear about eye level and then you could move them to the next property. So we were at this exotic animal auction buying llamas and the guy next to me starts bidding on this bobcat. And she was about six months old. And the owner said that his wife had gotten her as a pet, didn't want her anymore because she was becoming a bobcat. And I leaned over to the guy and I said, when that cat grows up, she is gonna tear your face off because there is nothing meaner on this planet than a bobcat. They are just really? vicious. <laughs> <laughs> if you said, I'm gonna throw you into a cage with a tiger or I'm gonna throw you into a cage with a bobcat, I'm like, give me the tiger. <laughs> <laughs> that bad. Oh, man, <laughs> they are just, they are hell on wheels. And I think it's because they're so small, they have to like make up for the fact that they're not 500 pounds. But at any rate, um, he told me he was a taxidermist and that he was just going to club her in the head in the parking lot and make a den decoration out of her. Wow. And I started crying and my husband started bidding and we probably paid more for that bobcat than anybody's ever paid for a bobcat that she wasn't gonna get clubbed in the head it on my watch. And so she came home with us and she had been, she had so many strikes against her. She had been declawed, so she couldn't hunt. She had been born in captivity, which wow. meant she couldn't be released. And she was born in another state, which made it illegal for release. So we had to keep her in our home and she was wretched as a pet. Um, she was everything you would expect a bobcat to be and was tormenting my family and our German shepherd. And so my husband started calling around trying to find somebody that he could raise up with her. And this guy said, I'll sell you a bobcat, but you got to come here in person. So we drove up to La Center, Minnesota in 1993, he got her in 92. And in 93, we drive up and there's this big shed and there's no sign out front, but we go inside and there's row after row after row of these cages where if you can imagine what a, a mink farm looks like or a rabbit farm, it's the exact same kind of cages, but with big cats in it. It had bobcats and Canada lynx and Siberian lynx. Wow. And the flies in there were so thick. We had to put handkerchiefs over our faces not to breathe them into our noses and mouths. And the cats were living in filth. They weren't getting any kind of vet care. And this guy's pulling out all these kittens and showing them to us. <clears throat> and I said, is there this big of a market for these as pets? And he said, no, this is a fur farm. And we're going to slaughter the ones we don't sell as pets next year for their fur. And so I just burst out crying. And my husband said, how much for every cat here? And we came home with 56 bobcats. <laughs> <Canada -like. laughs> so now we had 57 because <laughs> we still had Winsong. And the next year we took all 28 from that fur farm, taking all of the adults because we had to build cages for the adults. And then the following year, 22 off another fur farm. And then the following year we started, and that got all of the cats out of all of the fur farms in the US. And we started working on the fur farms in Canada when I lost my husband in 97. And so we got, I think maybe a dozen of them out of Canada, but then all of my assets were seized because of the conservatorship that was imposed by the courts. So I wasn't able to finish rescuing the cats in Canada. And it's only been in the last couple of years that finally the big fur um, designers have gone for free. And so that entire fur industry has died. And I think that's going to be a part of our barbaric past that will never be resurrected, thankfully. Good. And then people started calling saying, would you take my line? Would you take my tiger? I'm like, what? What are people doing with lions and tigers? And so I naively at every point along the way thought I can fix this and then I'll get back to protecting domestic kittens. <laughs> and so I thought it was going to be an easy fix because surely nobody should have lions and tigers in their backyard. And it's been what close to 30 years trying to fix this problem now. Wow. So it wasn't even you going out to look for it, come to you, honey, you that. No. Well, I did not for this. <laughs> do you okay? Are you okay getting in the cages of them? Do you not are they safe to a certain age is there a point where they got well they from day one are they quite dangerous i don't know nothing about them with from city boys so if they are with their mother for more than just a few days after they're born they will be like dealing with a feral cat they will bite and claw and scratch and just you can't touch them you can't get anywhere near them and that's why if you saw did you see tiger king yes yes so you saw that the mother's giving birth and you're pulling the baby out right then. That's how they do it. They have to take the babies away as soon as they're born before right. their eyes are open. Oh, okay. 
again. Okay. And so in and a lot of the cats that I've rescued over the years were cats who were born in captivity and taken like that. And typically they were used for cub petting until they were about 12 to 16 weeks. And then they go from being a huge asset that can generate $100,000 to being a cat that costs us $10,000 a year per cat just in food and vet care, not any of the overhead of the sanctuary. So as soon as they get past the ability to be used as cub petting props, these people dump them into private hands. And then a year later, those people have a 300 pound predator in their yard that they're calling us to come and get. So those cats that had been handled by people in the early days, I used to go into the enclosures with them in order to clean and um, um, mostly what I would do because we had volunteers that would help and I would hold the cat while they cleaned the cage because we didn't have any way of separating the cats. So my father came to work for me in 96 and he said, this is crazy. And so he started building cages that you may have seen in Tiger King. They made it look like that little box that the cats stand in. They made it look like that's the cat's cage. That's just where we would lock the cat either out while we put their food in there or lock them in there if we had to go in the cage to clean it. But um, I stopped handling the cats in about 2003 because after the internet came along, what I saw was and we used to invite people actually to come to the sanctuary and show them. We talked to them for an hour and a half about why these cats don't make good pets. And yet at the end of it, they'd still say, you know, well, I think I could do it differently. I think I can make a pet out of them. And so we started opening up cabins on the property where people could spend the night with a, and we did this with smaller cats, not lions and tigers, but we did it with uh, cougars and bobcats and servals. And all that cat wants to do all night long is pee on you. And once people had that experience, they didn't want to do it no more. Yeah. So when the internet came along, people were posing, you know, here's this picture of me with this cute little cub, or here's this picture of me standing with a cougar. And they weren't getting peed on. The people who were seeing it weren't, weren't getting peed on. And they weren't getting that full uh, impact of what we were trying to do. So we stopped allowing contact, stopped allowing people to spend the night with them. And completely, none of us here touch the cats or go in the cages with them unless it's like a medical emergency. My daughter and I might have to go in and net a cat. It, it won't come into that lockout. Sometimes when they feel bad, they don't want to come into the feeding area because they don't feel like eating, but the vet's got to see them. So we've got to go in there and get a net on them and get them into a carrier, but we don't handle them, you know, like cutesy petting kind of stuff. Because the film make it, the film makes it look a little bit like you're just there to get the biggest part, doesn't it? A little bit. They sort of try to, to twist it. Nothing like what you're saying now. It's unreal how they how they swing it's this just, stuff. It's just crazy. I mean, anybody who knows anything about us, you could spend five minutes researching Big Cat Rescue, and we have been since the '90s saying these cats don't belong in cages. They shouldn't be owned in captivity. We don't need them in zoos. We shouldn't be killing them for their fur. They don't belong in circuses. All of that has been our our message, and none of that came out in Tiger King. Um, you now you talk about guns as if it's nothing. Over here, it's not like that. So you got to just shoot a cat. So this is another thing. You know, what is the um the, the mindset of Americans with guns out there with animals and in general? You know, I know they say different different states are worse. Um, what's it like where you are with guns? I mean, you talk about it as if it's just natural, someone having a, a gun to shoot a cat. Yeah, it, it's one of those crazy things that I think that's been one of the hard, one of the reasons why it's been so hard to ban the private ownership of tigers is because there is such a huge lobby not to ban the private ownership of guns. And so, you know, we often say things like, well, you can't have a nuclear bomb in your house so you shouldn't be able to have a tiger, which is a nuclear bomb that can go looking for trouble on its own if it escapes, <laughs> unlike the bomb in your house. But I can't even make that connection to guns because there's such a, um, a feeling of entitlement in the US for everybody yeah. to possess guns and such a fear mongering among politicians to say, well, if you outlaw guns, then only outlaws will have guns. I mean, have you ever seen anyone, you said you're brought up in a working class or a lower working class area, trailer parks and places, have you ever seen any people get shot or things like that growing up? Is there any time in your life you've seen people shooting or heard it or something? I've been involved in the crossfire in um, alley shootouts when I was doing real estate investment. Most of the real estate that I invest in is in lower end. What's, an alley, what's an alley shootout? Um, like if you can imagine the houses that are very, very yeah. close together and, the there's like going down. Side, and then there's a little alley between the back sides of the houses where you usually- Oh, yeah, yeah. 
Okay. So um, I was looking at some real estate over in St. Petersburg. And it's interesting because St. Petersburg has um, very high code enforcement. So when you're driving around St. Petersburg, it just looks pristine and beautiful. Like mm. everybody is the right. perfect little house. And yet under that, it's just, it's a freaking nightmare of drugs <laughs> and guns and booze and derelicts. And they're all in those alleys. So anyway, I stepped out into an alley and there was like all this gunfire going on. I was like, all right, I'm back out of here. <laughs> but I was an adult yeah. by then. Yeah. Sorry? I was an adult by then. You ask if it happened when I was a kid. Yeah, but no, but when you had that old car, that's crazy, isn't it? And that's just normal, isn't it, out there? It's normal. And, you know, like, just go and shoot an animal. Is that legal? Can I just go and shoot, shoot a bobcat on the land? Is that legal in America? Because that wouldn't be tolerated here. Yeah, it is legal. Um, there are what they call hunting seasons, and you have to get a permit to do it. So that is why the, the mountain lion or cougar, they have a lot of different names here. We call them Florida panthers in Florida. And the Florida panther is actually an endangered subspecies, so it's illegal to hunt them. But um, across the rest of the U.S., we have cougars, which are about, a, depending on where you live, they can be anywhere from 60 to 250. <laughs> what, do you, what do you think? Sorry, go on. Well, they're, they're frequently shot, which unfortunately has just about wiped them out. And then that causes the entire ecosystem to crumble underneath it because you need those apex predators. What do you think about, I've been, I've been out there, my boy, um, to Florida, and I went up to St. Augustine, St. Augustine. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and they've got the dolphin, um, the dolphin place there where they keep dolphins. How do you feel about that? Is it in captivity? Yeah, yeah, they just all, I don't know if they put them back there. I don't know, I'm not sure what that place really does. I didn't really look into it, to be honest with you. But I think, I think they're more like sort of rescuing them and stuff there as well. But they do train them to do like the swimming thing and everything, you know, get people going there and get in with the dolphins and stuff. Do you know nothing about that place now? I don't know anything about that particular place, but I just, I don't feel like wild animals should be kept in zoos or amusement parks for the purpose of people seeing them. Mm. And I think the best way that we can save our planet is to turn all of those places into a place of virtual reality and augmented reality experiences, very immersive experiences. Sometimes there's a little bit of a generalization there because if we never done that to some level, how would we learn about them? Do you know what I'm trying to say? I'm not saying oh yeah, for, for people's viewing to go and see our oh, Sunday afternoon, let's go and see them. But do you f- still think that it has to be done to sort of see how they work, see how you know their hormones, their DNA and stuff? Do you think it's it's there is some sort of level of that? Because I so, think that's the excuse everything. that we use. I think it's definitely the excuse that zoos use that they're doing some kind of research or conservation. But what has that ever done to actually protect those animals in the wild? You can't name anything that it's done to help them. And as long as people can go and see a cat in a cage or a dolphin in a swimming pool, why will they ever spend the money or time or effort to save the wild places where those animals live free, where they can't see them easily? And that's why I think we need to be placing these 360 degree internet streaming cameras in places where these animals live, have that be available through um, headsets or through domed type projections where you are in that animal's world where it's actually living free somewhere and you're seeing what it's actually doing and you're actually learning what it does in the wild because a cat in a cage is just the shadow of who they are in the wild. You're not gonna learn anything from a cat in a cage. But all the money it's from more, those feeds should go back. The game board. parks in South Africa, things like that. That's a, b- a better way to learn, do you think? Because they're running free, they're running wild. It's better than going to a zoo and seeing an animal in a you know, 200 square foot cage, but it still puts pressure on the animal because I've seen people that go on these tiger safaris to India. And when you, you see, the, all of these jeeps are surrounding this poor tiger while it's trying to hunt and it's trying to do its business and it's trying to find a mate and raise its cubs and it's just constantly being surrounded by people who want to be there to get their selfies and their pictures all of that could be done remotely and the animal wouldn't be impacted by the people being in their environment and we would all be able to benefit from seeing those amazing scenes of the cat doing what they naturally do 
And the money from those internet feeds should go back to those local economies that live with tigers or lions or jaguars so that they have a reason to protect the forests and a way to, to feed their families. It's amazing, it's amazing. Well, I had no idea you was um, this much of a little angel for, um, <laughs> for, for the cat world. It's amazing to hear, hear your story. Um, so what's, your, what's next for Carol Baskin? What is the next mission? I, mean, I know you want to get this finished up. Is that you're not stopping so this is done? Is that, is that how it is for you? This is, this is you now, this is it. I just got back last night about 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock from Washington, D.C., and I was invited to speak to the chiefs of staff for all of the Republican senators. And so I was there lobbying for the Big Cat Public Safety Act. And that federal bill has 200 co-sponsors in the House, and we've got about 24 or 25 in the Senate. So that's why I was there trying to get more senators. But what that bill does is it prohibits cub petting, which is what drives all of the breeding of these big cats and then exploiting them for 12 to 16 weeks and then dumping them in private hands. So it gets rid of all of that. And then it phases out private ownership of big cats. People who have them can keep them. They just can't buy or breed more. And usually in private hands, these animals don't live past six, seven years old. So in the next decade, this problem will die out in America. That's good, that's good. Wow, wow, wow. So what is the next thing for you then? The next major task, the new vision for you to, to go to? Will you ever retire one day? Will you ever put your feet up? Or it's just not the way you're built? No, I didn't come here to retire. I didn't come here to screw off and, even, know. even though that film was, you know, you said it made it, they sort of swung it, made it negative in a lot of ways. And um, it has sort of put, give you like a voice, doesn't it? And like, you know, you're world famous now. Has that helped with your ability to help the, to help the animals? You know, I, I really no, wonder no, about that. I, I was afraid that because I had been portrayed as this gold digging, home wrecking murderer, yeah. that I would never be able to lobby Congress again. They'd be like, I don't think we want this person coming in our office, even though, you know, there's no truth to it. It's I mean, just I, because I, of that. As you told us, it must have been hard for you as well, you know, and then portraying you like that. It must have been, there must have been some mental stress for you through watching that. Did that hurt you a bit when you watched it? Did it hit home? The stress in it was more of what it did to my family. And if you can imagine somebody, picture for yourself, if somebody had said all of those things about you and you'd be like, I know that's not true. That's not who I am. I can't possibly be offended or hurt by people saying these things about me because that's not who I am. But people who love you, who feel like they have to get out there and defend you every time somebody says some snarky thing or acts nasty toward you, that was really hard on my husband and daughter and my parents. Well, not my father, he had already died, but my mother. I mean, all of our family had to deal with feeling like people, like they had to protect me from people. And all of them know that I don't take this personally and that I don't you know, dwell on that or anything. The only concern I had about it at all was whether or not I'd be able to continue to lobby for this bill. And being invited to speak wow. to the chiefs this uh, yesterday was like, all right, uh, this is good, I guess. It, I didn't know whether it was going to turn out to be good. Brilliant. That's amazing. Absolutely amazing. So what's, what, what would you say? Give us a little bit of advice. I've got no idea about cats. What would you say out of big cats is the most friendly and which one's the most? You said the bobcat's probably the worst one. You said already, I think. Is it really that, that, that vicious, is it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, even bobcats that have been hand-raised and that have been around me my, their entire life, if they don't want to do something, you're not making that cat do it. <laughs> they are just not going to do it. Whereas a tiger, if they don't want to do something, you know, they'll be like hemming and hauling, like, no, I don't want to go over there. I don't want to do that. Then you can coax and beg and plead, and they'll finally come along and do it. But bobcats, <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> and how many, how many acres of land do you have to have to, uh, your place? How many acres of land do you have there now? For Around 60, 67 acres, and we have 50 cats. Wow. And so you've got a big number of staff still running? Is it getting bigger? You know, actually, no, I lost half of my staff due to COVID. Oh, cool. We had, yeah. 
um, you know, when you're feeding 50 big cats and you have to take care of them because there's no place for them to go, if you're going to cut back on cost, it can't be on food, it can't be on vet care. So the only thing you can cut that's meaningful is the staff pay. And so we had about 22 staff in March of 2020 and I cut it down to half of that. And so the half of us who are left and my husband and I didn't take money, didn't take a paycheck for like eight or nine months, but the half of us are, that are left are working two and three jobs in order to continue the work in the sanctuary. But all of the animal care has always been done by volunteers. So thankfully, none of that was impacted by COVID. And one of your skills, would you say, would you say your, because I mean, I can't even imagine your organization. Would you say your, your preference is that you're a good planner? Is that part of, part of who you are, would you say? Well, it's funny because there's a, there's a uh, direct economy there. I plan for the future of what I see for the sanctuary and for the world and saving the tiger in the wild yeah. and all of that. But if you said, hey, let's go to the Keys tomorrow, I'd be like, all right, hop in the car and just start driving toward the Keys. Oh, yeah. Whereas everybody I know would be like, we have to find a hotel. We have to find yeah, out. Yeah. How far- I, I, I haven't got all my toiletries. I haven't got this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so you are quite spontaneous as well then. You can sort of flip between the two yeah. okay so what would you say to anyone out there um in the way the world's you know dealing with cats and you know what what should the world be doing more of what should we be because you know i think we've got enough education on it to be fair as well especially over here you know f- for me um what, what what do you think we could do more of towards animals what should be going on I think the UK is decades ahead of the US because you guys outlawed most of this stuff back in the 70s. Yeah, That's so why you don't have this problem. You, couldn't, you, can't hit, uh, you couldn't get caught hitting an animal without getting arrested. Yeah. And we've just been, we've been so negligent and the entire world should hate us because we are causing the extinction of these big cats in the wild. It's because of the untracked trade in the US captive big cat population that it's so easy for poachers to get away with what they're doing in the wild. And we just have to stop that. So if I had any advice to give to anybody or any, any, uh, if, if I ruled the world, <laughs> I, I would be telling people, don't pay to see a big cat, exotic cat in a cage for crying out loud. That money should be spent saving those cats in the wild and saving our planet as a result. I love that. I really love that. And I'd like to thank you very much for your time. It's been absolutely amazing. Actually, by me, well, you're such a lovely, um, a, a lovely way of thinking, and what you've devoted your your life to to these cats is actually, you know, I don't know what the word would be. It's just amazing that you've you've dedicated your whole life and you've got such a passion for it, and nothing's stopping you. Your determination and you just you just keep going. It's it's really remarkable. So. You know, I'm sure all the cats in the world are thanking you right now and um, <laughs> looking at you as their mother, Teresa, if you like. But um, that is a beautiful thing, it is. And, um, yeah, it was a really good interview, and I really was um, didn't know what to expect. And, yeah, you are such, such a lovely lady, and i like to thank you for your time and keep up the good work because you're doing amazing, obviously. Well, and, thank um, you. And can you tell me a little bit about you? Because I know doing a podcast on a regular basis is not an easy thing, so you must have some real mission yeah. behind what you're doing. Well, to, to be fair, what I've been doing from our from our vision on the other podcast, it's been more about, you know, um, this is a new bunch I'm doing now. So this is completely different than what I normally do. I look at I get people I look at people that have been in the elite category, like athletes or um, you know, world champions that I look at the world champions, I'll look at millionaires, billionaires, and I'll interview these sort of people so I can sort of show the world how the mindset works from creation from there's a part of the mind called the reticular activating system it's a group of neurons at the bottom of the brain that works as a filtering system and now through visualizations it's sort of like the science behind the law of attraction we can actually see what goes on there so you know it's that old one if you ever want to go and buy a car the car that you want you start seeing it everywhere um you know, when a woman's pregnant, all of a sudden everyone's pregnant. You know, your mama come in and go, I just see Julie down the shop. Her sister's cousin's having twins, got me sank in the water. And it's the same thing with, you know, with people looking for, you know, people that are like yourself looking for animals getting treated badly. You're going to be the person, your filter is going to be seeing all that information where people could be walking past it and not even 
you know, even though it's going on, you can see a cat laying down. We wouldn't even notice that it's getting mistreated because our filters not looking for cats getting mistreated. If that makes sense. So when people start to learn about that, you can sort of take the, the mindset from the elite and apply it to yourself. And obviously, I know that you're using that you've used this because what you've told me earlier already, you had a 25 year plan. I was with a guy called Peter Cratch. He was a big England football player, um, one of our superstar England footballers. And he said a similar thing. I went to him about, about visualizations, RAS system, and all this stuff. And he went, It's mad, Rob. He said, Because when I was, I said, I think it was about 14, he said, A guy came in and said, Write down a year plan. Give me a five year plan, what you want, what you want, and then write down like your goal, sorry, and a 10 year goal. And he said, I wrote them all down. He said, but I lost the paper, but I thought of them every day. He said, every day, every single one I would go through every day. He said, I never had a childhood. I never, I never had a girlfriend until I was 23. He said, but I'd go through these things. I was obsessed with it. And he said, every single one of them come true, including getting to play for England. And this guy's like, like a basketball player. He shouldn't be really a soccer player. That's what we all know. We meet a Peter Crash. Everyone knows him because he's like you know, seven foot tall, which soccer players ain't, you know? And um, he was a striker. So it was... It, you know, just to hear these, these same stories, again, no matter where people are being successful, you're going to hear these same stories of creating that vision, keeping it alive. You know, the dif difference between a visionary and a daydreamer is that a daydreamer will think one thing today and then change their mind tomorrow and then wonder why they're not getting anywhere. Whereas like yourself, you're eight years old, you've installed your, you know, once the RES system kicks in, it just becomes an old map pilot. If anyone's going to notice someone mistreating an animal, it's you, you know, you, you, you sense it in the air. Um, so that's what I've been doing with the other podcasts. You look at the, the mental, the mental side of it. But you know, talking to you, you're just obsessed with animals. It's just beautiful to hear. You're like your 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 filters all just into the animals, into the into that. Since you was eight years old, it was quite nice to just listen to you. And now you just that's why you're successful in where you are. You you know it's, you, you you are where you are because you you just you feel it's there. You're not giving up. You don't need to change it because you're living in alignment with what you want. You feel good. Um, you know, it's also, the, it's the reason why we like to, the RAS system is why we like to um, agree with things that we read. I think it's called a confirmation bias, yeah? So mm -hmm. we like to, we like to agree with things that we read. So people say, for instance, watch Tiger King and had a bit of, a bit of a thing in for you. They're going to love reading the bad stuff. They don't know they're doing it. It's just that it matches their filter, you know? And the brain likes to generalize information. We distort information and we delete information. So for an example, someone can go, oh, I, I ate cats, right? But they go, what do you mean you ate cats? Oh, I can't stand them. Fur everywhere on my sofa and all that, right? And then two days later, they're watching a film and go, oh, tigers are beautiful. I wish we could have a, I don't know, no, you shouldn't be saying that, but saying, I love a tiger. I think it's so beautiful. It's going to go, but I thought you ate your cats. Yeah, not that cat. I mean, an ass cat. So you distorted the information between what type of cat you're talking about. It could be a size. And our brain, just, you know, I don't like the colour green. But then an hour later, I'm going to love sitting over the park in the trees. And that's beautiful. And you go, if we didn't like green. And I go, yeah, well, I make clothes or in furniture. Not, I'm not in nature. I love it. So we distort and we delete information all the time. Um, and this is through our filter. So if I was look, you're looking at me right now and your brain had taken every piece of data. So you had taken every little piece of my face, every little wrinkle, every little mark on the wall behind me, the little purple flower over there in the mirror reflection. And if you're taking all that stuff and what's around the side of your peripheral vision in your room that I can't see that you can see now, if your brain had taken everything in simultaneously, our head would shut down. We'd melt, our brain would melt down. We won't be able to cope. So we need the, we need the reticulate the baiting system to stop the unconscious mind and the outside world, the conscious mind. So we need a filter to distort, delete and generalize information. That's why we we only pay attention to things we agree with. And um, this sort of information, I believe, should be put into schools because it means that we have to look at this. When, when people go, well, you know, no, it's like, I can't it. Cat. so if someone was to generalize, for instance, there should be no cages that should ever fit a cat again. Yeah. We should never have cages again. Honestly, it should be it's disgusting. We should never have any. And everyone gets rid of every cage in the world. Yeah. And then there's a tiger you want to go and help it because it's, it's a broke its leg or something. You go near it, it's going to rip your arm off. And you, you know, so what are you going to do? So that, you know, I'm trying to get at, that might not be good snow, but you know what I'm trying to get at, that there's always a place for that bad thing to be used in a good way. So that's what I was trying to get, get at earlier about the generalizations of um, sometimes, you know, they say we learn most of it about our medical, about our body um, and cure through wars, like the Second World War. We learned so much more about the body and how to 
fix things because they'd only have certain tools to work with and that would just make with the little drugs they had and the little bits and pieces and we learned new methods putting drugs together and stuff and just trying things trial and error in war is when we learned most of you know some of the best we get some of the best results in in the medical world so um it's just i love listening to looking at the generalizations that but you're pretty you're pretty spot on you're pretty moving forward you've got you know it inside out you know it's quite it's just a nice listening to you um and, and where is your filter focused my, you my, my filter is focused on um like you are a people mine is really helping up big in the mind i'm dyslexic i've adhd so sometimes when a lot of information i've got it's me to sustain the, my focus but i've got adhd i'm dyslexic i come from a council estate sort of like your trailer park sort of backgrounds if you like like a ghetto if you call it in america um see my first stab at 11 i see a shooting at 15 and so on um so i come from my map of the world's pretty poor and i and i was brought up in the 80s going to school walking down the flats with my mum holding around and they'd be all, all i remember is like sick every day on the phone pulling me away from the sick where everyone addicts would be jacking up and there'd be needles and but they got cleaned up by the 90s but the, the, the 80s was terrible for heroin and stuff where i lived and for me where i grew up i had low self-worth you know, really low self worth. I'm thick as shit. I'm a dyslexic. That's how I was made to feel. Um, dyslexic. I, you know, they weren't even ADHD then, and I don't even know what that was. So I'd be getting in trouble for not paying attention all the time. Get outside, I see you're not paying attention. You know, um, or you know, I'd be tapping my foot. Stop tapping your foot. And then I'm sitting there like I can't think. And I'll start tapping my hand because of my ADHD. But again, I'll get in trouble for things like that. So I hated school. So for me. I love learning about the mind. I help everyone. I work with the elite category of athletes and actors and stuff as well. Um, and I work with anyone. I've got my own UMT Academy that I'm building. So that's a big thing for me getting that. Cause I want to put UMT, not so much academies to teach the kids to be a therapist, but I'd like to get a UMT unconscious mind therapy, my own therapy for working class areas. That's my vision. I don't really care about the middle class because we can't relate to them. The middle class and the upper class, they can relate pretty easy. You know, they can deal with policies. But when you're in that working class area, you don't give a shit. We want to be as a drug dealer or an armed robber, one of the two, because any, anyone on that area who's got money, that's what they're doing. So you only you only aspire at a young age to look to the people that make your money and got the nice girls and the nice cars, either selling drugs or, or doing robberies, yeah? Um, your dad was a bricklayer. My dad's coming home a fucker. We're going up the pub on the weekend, you know what I mean? Spending a little bit of money, like, not shit, if we went on holiday at all. Um, so my vision is to help the working class areas, like the real rundown, because I remember watching, I think it was Live Aid in the 1986, 87, something like that, and Feed the World, yeah? And I was only about 10, I think it was 10, 87. And I remember sitting there, and I mean, all my parks in my where I lived had no swings in you know the, there was oil and stuff and the slides all dented up and they were, you, you only play with your football on a concrete land and that was it and they were going to feed the world as a kid i remember thinking why don't they help us first why you know why isn't the money away like it was just weren't like racist thing weren't no you know political thing i was 10 years old i just think why are they sending all the money and we're not even got a nice country because i didn't see the nice country i never went out to the posh areas or anywhere i never knew there was nice Real areas like that. Thought, that was like the movie stuff, and I couldn't get me a brand it. And um, I remember thinking, and when I worked with a guy called Robert Dilts from California, it's NLP, and he stripped my mind back to discover, you know, if you had all the material things and being poor, I want a big car, I want a big ass. Then what would make you happy? I want a Rolex. Then you got a Rolex. I have another five. Then what make you happy? My kids go to private school. Then what make? And he drove me mad. And then I'm thinking, he's getting on my fucking nerves now. Do you know what I mean? Like, but he broke me down to a place where I had no more answers. That I had everything in the world material and now what make you happy and i sort of realized i went it was the hardest question i ever answer and i was like yeah i thought i like making what makes me smile without any anything material was seeing other people smile because i had low self-worth i don't like to see other people with low self-worth so someone said i have to i have to get silly i'll, I'll take the piss out myself to make someone else smile and things like that so and, and that's when like at that moment my mind is weird i was having all these like and they say like a light bulb moment, it was really that. And that image, and I forgot about that that thing. And I was thinking about, you know, helping people and with the mind like me, dyslexic and so on. And, and this 
memory come out of nowhere, that memory. And I remember thinking, well, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go back to all the working class areas. I'm going to crack it. I'm going to build myself up and open businesses. I'm going to work with the elite. I'm going to work world champions. And this is when I had nothing, like no, no qualifications really at this point. I was still learning. I went, this is what I'm going to do. Build myself up to number one. I'm going to raise like, all the money myself. And then I'm going to go back and set up, fun, set up places in um, Bermondsey is where I come from, South London. Then there's like Brixton. And then there's rough areas in Manchester called Mossai, Salford. Then you can go over to like... Um, Toxteth, Liverpool, East End of Glasgow. There's like areas where people don't, you can't even go in there because it's like where I lived. You couldn't walk in there because if you didn't know someone, you think, what are they fucking doing in here? So, and it's actually quite a safe community if you're in them communities, If you, if, but if you're not, it ain't. So my, my thing is to go and help the working class kids because I see people stab people for 20 quid and silly money, yeah? And you think if they've got that much hunger for money because they're so poor, imagine if you give them a bit of vision. If you, imagine if you can tell them, like, you can make so much more money just doing this and you can find something that they've got a passion about that's going to give them that pulling feeling that you've had since you was eight because that ain't no pushing feeling. You don't get up in, you said the hours you work, you don't get up in the fucking morning and think, oh, I've got to push myself to go to work today. Oh, it's Monday morning. To you, you it's pulling you out of bed. It pulls you to, it's just, you know, we just got back last night, as you said. For me, it's the same with the mind. It pulls me. I get up on a Monday and people go, I love Monday morning. I'll get more tired. I'll get more. My kids wear me out on a Sunday. I'm running about with them all day. I come back, I'm like, ah. and then, you know, on a Monday, I'm like, oh, it's easy for me. It's, it's my passion. So just like you, I don't work because I don't like that word work. It ain't work to me. And I know they say them cheesy, but it sounds like a cheesy saying when you're poor and you ain't and you're in a shit job. And they say, you know, find something you love and you don't work no more. Something along those lines, ain't it? And um, it's true. It's but, true. Yes. It's true. And sometimes you're working on something you don't even know how passionate you are until it starts moving. And then it's like, nah, nothing's, nothing could stop me because I just don't give a shit if I get knocked down. I lost a business, not lost a business. As I said, I won't get on a business. But last year, I lost about 100 grand on a, on a uh, company in Spain because of COVID. Everyone's dreaming up going, oh, well, I'm really worried about what you're going to do. I'm like, I don't fucking know. I don't know what, what am I going to do. It ain't open. If it opens June, I'll open it in June. If it opens in, well, I can't, what can I do? So what I've done is put my mind into the next level. Yeah, I was gutted. I was upset. I, I never give myself time to, I went, I need to build something else now, you know, and I started building up podcasts and um, all sorts of things, like lives. I started doing lives, actually, with celebrities through lockdown, talking about mental health and stuff. So... Yeah, that's what I'm into. I'm into the mind. I'm passionate. Yeah. Like, you, like your passion for um, helping cats is mine to help in. It's really weird. It's the working class kids. I don't really give a fuck about the upper class kids because I know where I've been brought up. They've not had that struggle. So they're bad. I ain't, could be our good, if that makes sense. Does that make sense? They're, they're bad could be our good in some areas of their life. Oh, you know, yeah. oh, these trainers are a bit dirty. And they need to put, you know, some to us. I've got fucking my feet hanging out of them. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's... It's that sort of thing, I mean. So I'm more, the working class is my passion. That's my vision, anyway. Well, that's a wonderful vision. And, you know, something you just said, I think is so true. It doesn't even matter what your job is. It's not that you have to love your job so much. You have to love what your mission in life is. And you won't care what your job is because you're like, this is what I need to fund this over here. I'm going to do this as best I can to get that. It's like a vet, isn't it? We could go, oh, you know, you, people sort of put it, you know, you, you're a worker and all this sort of all these entrepreneurs say that but it doesn't matter if you like animals and you want to be a vet and you're saving vets life and that's a passion and you you're getting that pull to go in the morning because you know you've got these animals to help that's fucking you're, that's, that's a blessing I had a school teacher out of, I said to a lot of people think of it in school right how many teachers did you like there was like one or two and you know because they were meant to be fucking school teachers they were the ones that would be a bit strict but they let you off they play and they went to shut you up and they, they loved it. And, you know, they'd, they'd go home on their small wages and they'd knit themselves some mad luminous orange jumper with, you know, and they'd be that sort of wacky teacher. But you knew when you talked to them, they wanted to be a teacher since they were a little girl. That was what they wanted to do. And I got a, my, my ex-wife's um, best mate. She was, she was at school. Since she was in primary school, she wanted to be a teacher. Secondary school, she wanted to be a teacher. Now she's in the, like an ed, an ed mistress. She's, she's lucky enough to find that alignment since she was young. And I think the schooling system knock it out of us. You know, I think they, they knock it out of us because the old mindset around school is how not to make mistakes. And you give me a, and they say, give me a four-year-old kid and they always want to be, I want to be a Spice Girl. I want to be a Rocket Man. You know, I want to work with Tigers, yeah? Give me them when they're seven years old and they go to school and they go, 
Okay, so, so for the first few years of their life, you let them draw with crayons, tigers, and cars, and they can be creative, be creative. And they get about seven, you slap them on the hand and goes, don't draw in your book. This is how you spell. This is how you write. This is how you color. This is how you shade. And you're going to do it how our teacher. Because if you don't, I'm going to mark you as an F. And the little kid goes, what's an F? And they go, a failure. I don't want to be a failure, miss. We we'll do as you're told. So there's a thousand kids in the school got to do the thing the same way that's told when, how. Otherwise, they're going to be marked as a failure. And there's nothing creative about it. They're just taking all their creativity. So that kid who had vision and goals, when they get to 18, you go, what do you want to be? My little nephew. I don't know, Uncle Robert. I mean, what, you, what are you good at? He went, well, I'm good at maths. I might be, I might do a can't. So I went, do you like maths? He went, no, I fucking hate it. So I went, you know, we you good at it. Don't matter. They don't like it. You know, they, they're just, they're so scared of picking a, a, picking a, a job or something. So, you know, it's, sometimes it's our blessing to, to find our calling for other things. And, um, you know, and this is why we're going to work in class areas and get them when they're young to visualize and find out what they like, you know? So I was a kid the other week said he, he, he wanted to learn to spell, but he wouldn't, I'm not writing. I can't write. I'm dyslexic. You like me? So I went, all right. You got to practice and stuff, didn't you? Writing. You know, as the conversation started talking about hip hop and music, I love music more and all that. I went, well, why don't you do some write some raps then? If you reckon you want to be a rapper, I went. Well, I've always wanted to. But next thing you know, I've got him writing raps and that. Yeah, he, he come in about. I see him about two months later. He had paperwork like that. He had stacks. I, listen, his spelling probably weren't great, but it would have. He pre- he's practicing. Doesn't writing. have to be for rap. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, don't have to be for rap. Yeah. It's all slang anyway. But he made, you know, he's, he's still practicing writing, and obviously spelling will get better because it can't not. Um, so you know, it's 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 just uh, div- diverting the attention into something you like. You know, I said people want to lose weight. The easiest way to lose weight is not focus on losing weight. Focus on running three miles one week, then running six miles the next week. If and if the effect of that's losing weight, so you, you know what I mean. So you you, you work you focus on fitness and or. or or lung growth or whatever, then the effect of that's weight loss. If you're focusing on weight loss, it becomes a chore. You've got to have that goal that pulls you, haven't you? See, yours is bigger than just the cats. It's like saving the cats and taking away the whole, the whole suffering, what, what they're doing for them. And that's a fucking massive image. That's what pulls you out of bed and goes, fuck you in the morning to everyone else. Like, okay, I'm still can. Because if you never had that big image, it'd be, oh, what do they, because if you, I always say this, Carol, if you don't see yourself through your own eyes, you're going to see yourself for other people's eyes. So if you ain't visualizing who you are. That is brilliant. True, isn't it? That is going to be like, how do you pronounce your last name? Hissy? Hiasy. Yeah, yeah. Hiasy. Hiasy. Like, Hiasy. It's going to be like Robert Hiasy after that quote. If you <laughs> don't see yourself through your own eyes, you'll see, see yourself, yourself through other, other people's. Eyes. Yeah. It's true. Wow. Because that's what we do. Because we, if I say, and I've, I've got a little metaphor that I teach people when they want to lose weight or something, I go, so... If you ain't visualizing the body you want, if you ain't seen like six months time or a year's time, you're walking down the beach in a bikini, you, you know, or whatever it, whatever it is you want to look like, you're wearing that suit, at, uh, you know, some seminar. Whatever. If you ain't got that vision in your mind of what you're going to look like, you ain't going to create the pulling feeling. You're gonna, that's the will, like you. You're willing to do whatever the fuck it takes. You ain't trying, you just got, you're just willing. And the willpower is a pushing feeling, yeah? So you have to push yourself to do it. It's like, I've got to go gym to lose weight. You get that. You have to push yourself to go for it. Let's. I've got to lose some weight. I've got to diet. You got to push yourself to stop eating. That can't be sustained because it's pain. The human mind will run away pain faster than it go towards you know pleasure. So you have to make sure you just got the pleasure side there. You know, and if you're visualizing the body you want, you're going to start getting that pulling feeling. And what happens is if you if you ain't got no vision of who you are, that body in the future, and you ain't creating that pull. You're not in the will section. You're in the willpower section. And then what will happen is you can go to your mate. Guess what, Julie? I'm going to lose a stone. In, I'm going to lose a stone this month. I don't care what you're going to lose it. And she go, Carol, listen, you've tried before in the past to lose a stone. If you lost half a stone and kept it off, you'd be happy, wouldn't you? And then you go, yeah, I would. I would be happy, Julie. I would be happy. Yeah, if I keep it off, I would be. You've just dropped your standards 50 fucking percent because you've just seen yourself through her eyes. And her belief system, because you ain't got one. But when you visualize yourself and you practice that and the RES filter kicks in, they'll go to you, you know what, I'm losing a stone in a month, you'll go to her. And she'll go, babe, listen, if you was to, you know, if you lost half a stone in a month, you'd be happy, wouldn't you? The difference in mindset would be, no, I'm losing a stone. I ain't asking you. I'm going to lose a stone in this month. I won't ask you a question. I'm saying, I'm gonna lose. And they look at you and, they, and your mate's going to you, 
I've seen you not lose weight. I'm, I'm telling you this time. And people, people will think you're mad or think, oh, yeah, that old bullshit. But that's when you're making the change, when you start reframing and creating that vision of what you want. Um, I like to explain vision is not the key. That ain't the magic. People, oh, put a vision board. Who's got a vision, vision, vision? Vision without emotions, fuck all. It's a picture. So vision is a translator. Yeah. Words are the language to the brain. Feelings is the language to the heart. If you're feeling anxious and you go, I really don't want to be anxious no more. Fuck, would you still feel fucking anxious? Yeah. The only way you can change your emotion is then to visualize yourself happy on the beach, chilling. Because your unconscious doesn't know what's real and what isn't. It doesn't know what you're seeing in your mind or what you're creating as, a, as an image. You don't know what you store as a memory or what you imagine to be a memory. So when you start to visualize it, you can start to, yeah, look good there. You start to smile because you you, you're now you're saying to yourself there, one side of the brain, yeah, I want to I, I want to be I want to be happy. Well, I don't want to be anxious anymore, so I want to be I want to be thin. So you visualize yourself with the body you want, and your body goes, oh, that feels good. Oh yeah, oh, we can do that if we both work together. So you keep visualizing, the body keeps feeling. So it's a bit like if 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 I could speak Chinese and we was having this interview now, I'd need a translator. So I'd speak in Chinese. And then he'd, he'd, he'd get the words and he'd translate it to you. Then you speak, you go, okay, tell him nine. I ain't paying that much for it. I want this. And he'd come back to me in English. Yeah. So that's what the vision is. The vision is the translator from your mind to your body. It's all it is. So people focus on the vision. The vision ain't focused. The magic you get from the vision. The vision is like you're painting, but then your body has to give you the emotion. And you practice, you only get about 30 to 40% of the, um, the feeling of what it would actually be like if you're there. But imagine how good it's going to feel. But what people don't realize is when you do this process, you don't never get this moment where you go, yeah, because you already start to feel successful. I've been telling everyone I'm the UK's number one unconscious mind therapist. Not before anyone fucking introduced me, is it? I don't give a fuck how you see me. My medallion said I'm the greatest. At 18, he wins the Olympics in Rome. They thought it was that flash bastard. I think it's fucking knocked out. You know, it was it, my medal. was stepping backwards. They go, boo, stand like a fight like a man. And they go, I'm too pretty to get hit because no one ever stepped backwards before. It was you as a coward. You had to go toe to toe. America still scoring aggression now. He changed the history of boxing in the fucking Olympics. He was a visionary. He was creating every, everything gets made twice. When he was going into these things and doing them, what do you call them? Like poems. Oh, I'm so fast when I turn the light switch off. I'm in, I'm in bed before the room's dark. Yeah. He never, he wasn't a gangster rapper. He wasn't freestyling that shit. He wrote that stuff down. He memorized it, and he had a vision of where he was going to use it on TV interviews. And when he got on TV, I'm, I'm you know, I'm so cold. I murdered a stone or something in it. Like last night, I tussled with a wow. I'm so mean, I throw lightning in jail and all that stuff. He wrote all that stuff and memorized it so he could be the personality that he started, that he created. So this is what people got to understand. Everything gets made twice. First, inside the mind as a thought, as a vision, and then it gets created outside here in your reality. So, and if you look around the room you're in, try to find me something that never got made twice, except for what comes from nature and the earth in its original form, like tigers, humans, um, oxygen, trees, plants, cats, dogs, wind, rain, all that sort of stuff. See if you can find me out anything else that never started in the human's brain. There's a, there's a vision, there's nothing. You're wearing a fault, you live in a fault, you're sitting on a fault, you drive a fault, you put, you know, your lipstick's a fault, right? When you actually look around, everything's been made twice. So there's these signs everywhere saying, well, why are you trying to make something outside of you? Because it's the old model of reality, cause and effect. The old model of reality was, you know, something outside of you calls you to feel that way. Well, which is the truth. That's how we get problems. If someone punches you, it fucking hurts you. If your, boy, if your boyfriend cheats on you, you're going to feel the pain. But that ain't how cure comes about. Cure and change, that's how we get the pain and the problems. But how we... How we reframe that it's not going oh i need you to make me feel better carol i need you to give me this love and i'll feel whole no it's about you going inside yourself and creating it inside your mind and then it gets happened outside it like you got reframed from saying out of you change the way you feel inside we go inside and it happens it gets made twice it has to be made that way so i wish you never asked me now i kind of run i should get too passionate then i me ADHD no, keeps, I, I, I think it's fascinating <laughs> go on one <laughs> The only thing that's hard is I'm from the south and we speak really slow, so I'm having to really concentrate. Oh, really? On how fast yeah, you speak. I do. I get I get carried away when I go to America. The, the, I, I, it's amazing when you see you on the movies. You don't realize how slow you talk compared to us. And I pulled up one day in Florida and I asked this guy. I went. I was at my little boy and was looking for Disneyland. Some Iowa sank. I went, "Hello, mate." I said, 
how do we get onto the, I don't know, say it's the Donald Duck Highway or something, or some road was going in. Okay. You drive about three blocks this way. You'll see a, you'll see a roundabout. You take the fourth exit. You'll drive along and you'll come across. I'm already fucking done what you're talking about. It's so slow for my brain. I'm thinking, what? <laughs> he's only done two turnings. I can't remember it. It's so slow, but it's mad that we get as different cultures get linked to tempo, ain't it? You know the way the, in the in the song that we sing. <laughs> but enough of going on about the mind with you. I've um, really enjoyed your time um, having you on here, Carol, and your story. It was actually mind blowing, actually. And um, thank you very, very much. I really, really appreciate it. And, My pleasure. Uh, if for any reason this doesn't save on your end, let me know and I'll send you the link on my end. I will do. Thank you very much. So Thank back you. again next week at the Mind Kite podcast. And a big thank you for um, Carol Baskin's wonderful stories and time. And we'll see you again soon.